Namaste, brothers and sisters of the world. This is your friend Vidya Bhushandar, once again on a featured program on Tag TV, Tagline with Vidya Bhushandar. I feel a lot of positive energy today around me as I'm surrounded by Ram Dhun globally and some very young people in the studio to share their thoughts with me. Our topic of the day is Hindu phobia in general and especially in our academia, in our colleges and university campuses. Our purpose is navigating Hindu identity through the lens of Canadian university students. We aim to explore the diverse experience of students expressing their Hindu identity and the unique challenge they face at a personal, imperson interpersonal, organizational, and institutional level. Specifically, our panelists will share their encounters with Hindu phobia and discuss the strategies they use to effectively address and overcome their challenges. Through their experiences, we aim to understand the significance of cultivating university environments that embrace inclusivity for Hindu students, fostering an atmosphere where diverse identities are not only acknowledged, but celebrated. Hindu phobia or anti-Hindu hatred have a tragically long history, which continues to this state across the globe. They are fueled by a range of factors, including religious intolerance, religious exclusivism, a lack of religious illiteracy, misrepresentation in the media, academic bias still rooted in oftentimes racist, colonial era misportrayals, and in the diaspora, generalized anti-immigrant xenophobia and hatred. So, what is Hindu phobia? A working definition of Hindu phobia was developed in the year 2021 at the Understanding Hindu Phobia Conference held at Rutgers University. What it says, it says Hindu phobia is a set of antagonistic, destructive and derogatory attitudes and behaviors towards Sanatan Dharma, which is Hinduism, and Hindus that may manifest as prejudice, fear or hatred. Hindu phobic rhetoric reduces the entirety of Sanatan Dharma to a rigid, oppressive and regressive tradition. Pro-social and reflexive aspects of Hindu traditions are ignored or attributed to outside non-Hindu influences. This discourse actively erases and denies the persecution of Hindus while disproportionately painting Hindus as violent. These stereotypes are used to justify the dissolution, external reformation, and demonization of the range of indigenous Indic knowledge, traditions which are generally known as Sanatan Dharma. The complete range of Hindu phobic acts extends from mis microaggressions to attempt at genocide. Hindu phobic projects include the destruction and desecration of Hindu sacred spaces, aggressive and forcefully proselytization of Hindu population, targeted violence towards Hindu people, community institutions and organ organizations, and ethnic cleansing and genocide. Hindu Canadians are hardly exempt from such attacks on their religion and culture. Worse yet, the existence of Hindu phobia and anti-Hindu hatred is often denied, which itself is a form of the same. Ha! Ah, in the past several years, anti-Hindu hate crimes ranging from temple desecrations to vandalism to acts of physical violence have been on the rise in Canada, our Karam Bhumi, which we call home. Today, we will talk about Hindu phobia in educational institutions in Canada. And my panel today represents Nari Shakti or Women Power. And I'm pleased to introduce my guests. And before I do that, I'd like to invoke the Devi who represents Shakti. Ya Devi Saro Bhuteshu, Shakti Rupen Samastita, Namastas Se, Namastas Se, Namastas Se, Namo Nama. I'll ask the guests to introduce themselves one by one. So I'll start with Kashmina Mangal. Kashmina, can you please introduce yourself? Namaste, everyone. And JC Taram, as we like to say it in the Caribbean. My name is Kashmina Mangal, and I am the outreach liaison at the University of Toronto for the Hindu Student Council, also known as HSC. I am currently majoring in health and disease and minoring in psychology and immunology. In terms of how I contribute to the Hindu community, I'm a dancer, so I like to involve myself in different types of dancing for the divine, especially Radha Krishna dances. They're particularly my favorite. I'm also a versatile singer in classical mu music, so I do a lot of kirtan and bhajans, and I also play harmonium. Beyond the school, community, and academia, I do volunteer at several mandirs in the GTA, and I currently am a director at one of them. And I also participate in the Hindu Federation events. 
So that is my quick introduction. Thank you for having me. Wonderful, here. wonderful. I mean, you are so young, and you know, accomplishments are so you know large and wide widespread. Salutes to you. Uh, the next uh, panelist is uh, Kushi Jaitley. Kushi, can you please introduce yourself? Yes. Uh, Namaskar and Jai Shri Ram, everyone. Uh, my name is Kushi. I'm a student at OCAD University. I'm in my fourth year pursuing integrated media. Um, so OCAD University is Ontario College of Art and Design. Um, and as a Hindu artist, a lot of my pieces and a lot of my practice is informed by Hindu philosophy directly or indirectly. Um, I find a lot of my inspirations for my current projects uh, from the Hindu philosophy. And um, it is something that is very integral to my practice as an artist and also as a student. Um, in terms of advocacy, I advocate for Hindu phobia on campus. Uh, I'm the founder and the president of the Hindu Students Council at the Okada University campus. We started with two members. Now we have 60 plus members on our um, council, which shows the power of having a Hindu student council and having Hindu representation on campus. Um, and also highlights the power of advocacy and how advocacy helps not only bring students together, but also students feel safe um, in an academic environment. Wonderful, wonderful, Aditi. So the next panelist is Aditi Asnora. Kushi, thank you so much for introducing yourself to us. And you. uh, I must compliment you for whatever you have achieved in such a short span of time. Thanks. Aditi, can you please unmute yourself? Yes, of course. So, Namaste, Jai Shri Ram. I'm Aditi Asnura. I'm a first year student at Queen's University and I founded the Hindu Students Council chapter on campus. And I was recently appointed to HSE's national board as well. And I mostly advocate on raising awareness on Hindu phobia and Hindu genocide. And my work really relies on um, raising awareness on how the support of Hindu genocide occurs under the guise of social justice movements, you know, with the Free Kashmir movement. And um, I'm so grateful to be here today to share my experience. Wonderful. So I bow to the Nari Shakti, which basically is representing the panel today. And I'll start my question with uh, Kashmina. Kashmina, what aspect of Hinduism do you like the most? I mean, say, what resonates with you most and why? I think what resonates most with me is Katha, especially in my community. Katha was a very important part of how we celebrated celebrations, how we understood our religion, like Ramayan, how we understood the Gita, how we understand the Srimad Bhagavatam. They all played a major role in how I grew. And I also take inspirations from them for my dancing. And so it helps me understand how to dance and how to portray the stories like Dashavatar, as I mentioned before, Radha Krishna, even aspects of the Ramayan recent in a few years ago, a dance I did was like inspired by the Ramayan. Not really a few years ago, but more like a couple. And so I believe that Kata, so story, which is story, but it's not really a story. It's how I connect to my religion, what I really like about it the most. Wonderful, wonderful. Can you uh, can you share a specific incident where you personally felt targeted or marginalized on campus because of your Hindu identity? I would love to. I would like to point to the Rata Yatra that we actually had in collaboration with Kushi at OCAD. We had an incident at that there was a petition, which I believe Kushi will talk a little bit more about later that um, it felt really uncomfortable. And it was like, this is just a celebration here. We're just trying to bring joy to our campuses, try to show some unity, try to show some devotion, and we're getting targeted. So we thankfully, and thank God that the university got involved for us and they took some security measures. They were, there was um, security on bikes, securities in their cars, kind of covering our route to campus from U of T to OCAD. So I really appreciated that. But that was a really hard event, especially that it was our very first it was our very first collab event of the season. So it was a bit scary, but you know, I'm glad that it went smoothly. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, so I'll bring in Kushi here. Kushi, can you uh, recall what exactly happened? Like, you know, yeah. what was the plan and like, you know, why it was, why you were derailed and then how did you make it happen? Of course. Um, so I'll start by talking 
the Ratayatra itself. Uh, so we came up with this plan. Uh, we had a leadership summit, an HSC leadership summit in this early summer, and we came up with this plan to collaborate with UFT and OCAD um, because we're like five minutes apart, like five, 10 minutes apart walking. Uh, from one another to do a start a Ratha Yatra from uh, the Jagannath Ratha Yatra. And, um, and we started from, because UFT has a temple on campus. Mm. So start, do a mandir, like do a puja in the morning and then start the Ratha Yatra from there. And then come and, you know, bring the Ratha to Okhad University um, while doing Kirtan. And it was a huge celebration of art and we had like 35 plus like local artists and vendors in the event and um, it was a grand event and I think like a thousand people attended that day it was a huge event um but two days before the Ratayatra actually happened um a few professors from or I don't want to say professors but a few people from University of Toronto started a uh, petition to ban our Ratayatra because wow. it was because for them they they tied it to their you know and it's like they're like a broken record now like you know there's a pattern we see in these um hindu phobia mm. very hindu phobic like petitions or um oh we're calling out a particular organize a particular hindu organization to doing this and it's cast you know this the same things cast oppression uh, oppression of minorities and um you know tying it to a specific political event that might have happened somewhere in india that happened like 30 40 years ago mm. so this time they were tying it to a certain political ratayatra that happened in another like part of india like not even the same state so they and they objectified the word ratha and yatra and they said that oh like you know you shouldn't use Rath Yatra for your um, event, you shouldn't celebrate Jagannath Rath Yatra because it perpetuates a hateful and oppressive narrative in the Canadian landscape. And seeing that like two days before, um, I think all of us were very disheartened because for OCAD personally, this wasn't the first time something like this was happening with us. Um, but I'm grateful for our universities, honestly, who um, like for us, the dean brought it to us and the dean was like, hey, like, you know, I wanted to bring this to your attention and I wanted to make sure how you guys are feeling. And the school was going to initially charge us for security, but then they like covered everything. They gave us extra guards and the guards made sure like there were instances when people during the Rathiata, there were three or four instances where people actually tried to come in and like stir some trouble but the security guards were on top of that and we had Wonderful. briefed our teams. But then at the same time, it's just one sense of Hindu pride equates to oppression and hate. And, you know, and it's like I, I like giving people the benefit of doubt. It just seemed that it was done very strategically, like mm. two days before while we're doing our Rathayatra. And I think what's disheartening and it's also very eye opening because a lot of people denied the existence of institutional hindu phobia what was the eye opening that um 51 or 51 or 151 um i don't remember the exact number now but uh professors from ontario signed that petition wow it's it's a narrative that's been basically built up in the academia exactly. and that that's what hurts but you stood your ground and you were able to basically you know do what you wanted to do. That's wonderful. Yeah. Uh, I'll go back to uh, Kashmina. Kashmina, how did this experience impact you personally and academically? I think, I don't think it really affected me more academically because, you know, you've always faced problems in academia, but more in terms of like, I, this, I think was like my first bland personal um, encounter with Hindu phobia. And I was like mind blown. I'm like, I understand that like I've seen Mandirs get vandalized and stuff, but I didn't expect it to happen in a school setting because it really hadn't happened before, especially when I was sitting on HSC and that was been it's been since my second year. So I was more like alarmed. I was like, why would people do this? Why would people come? We live in a country where we have the freedom to have expression, have the freedom to religion. So why is this a 
thing. So I was just really like, surprised that it actually even happened and I was surprised that I had to deal with it that we had to deal with it as a team between OCAD and UFT so it was more like an eye-opening experience that this is actually a thing and it's not just something that you see on the news it happens within a school as well but thank god for both universities actually stepping in and doing something about it so basically if you put it to the right people at the right place and the right time with with the right you know attitude and aptitude it things happen so the joy of making it to happen has, must have doubled mm -hmm. wonderful yeah. so i will go back to uh, aditi uh, aditi what are the some of the key hindu issues you advocate for in your university um the key well the first thing that i advocate for is raising awareness about the existence of hindu phobia a lot of people deny its existence because their excuse is that hindus make up the third largest religion in the world so that means we can't experience you know prejudice and discrimination, but that frankly isn't true. And then I also raise awareness of Hindu phobia under the guise of social justice. So we all know about the Free Kashmir movement, which is a settler colonialism movement. It seeks to erase the Hindu identity and Hindu indigeneity to Kashmir. It claims that, you know, Hindus are colonizers and that they never, they weren't, um, that they aren't native to Kashmir. But um, there's also like the anti-caste movement and it's just super disheartening to see that people like fall for these traps that extreme when we usually when we recognize prejudice and discrimination it always comes from like right wing media or like extremist um figures but it's harder to recognize when it's from a place when there's supposed to be progressive movements and social justice so that's what i primarily focus on and advocate for because it's a lot harder for people to recognize that hindu phobia exists in these spaces wonderful so it's a personal question again, you know, the way you're speaking. So I want to ask you, why are you, why are you so passionate about advocacy? Um, so a couple of years ago, I started getting more involved into Hinduism, getting more um, connected to my Hindu identity. Prior to like 2021, I didn't identify as Hindu. And once I did starting, started identifying as Hindu, I saw a whole new level of like prejudice that I was facing. Being a person of color in Canada, I faced the occasional racism, but Hindu phobia, I've never seen quite, I've never seen anything like it. It's, it's possibly the worst form of discrimination that I've ever experienced. And it's always from these progressive spaces. I rarely ever, I've, in all my instances of experiencing Hindu phobia, it's rarely ever been from, you know, like a right wing point of view or like extremist um, points of view. It's always been from a progressive space, a space that's supposed to be dedicated in uplifting marginalized voices. Instead, they're suppressing ours. Perfect, perfect. So, Kashmina, you are uh, from the Caribbean, Caribbeans, right? Uh, unmute yourself, uh, please, Kashmina. So how do you navigate challenges related to your Indo-Caribbean identity along with the intersection of your Hindu identity? Because I really appreciate the fact that like, you know, Hindus from India who came to Caribbean some few hundred years back and they still carry that legacy with them. It's, it's, it's really amazing and like, you know, the most refreshing that how they are still able to keep their, their names, their religion, they fast. They, they, they follow the rituals and, you know, festivals. So how do you navigate challenges related to your, that Indo-Caribbean identity? I think, thank you for the question. I think it's really about adapt ap adaptability and staying true to your roots and recognizing how much sacrifice that your ancestors did. So just to give a brief, like overview of what actually occurred. Why did we end up in the Caribbean? We were taken as indentured servants to work in the sugarcane fields mm. by um, an, a group uh, from the Europe. I kind of don't want to get too much into it or too political about it, but you were taken into the sugarcane fields. And, you know, over time, there was a lot of incidents which led to like loss of language. Like for me, not that many generations ago, they knew how to read from the Ramayan. But if you go back, like maybe two generations for me, um, or one generation, they there's like this loss of language that occurred. So it's not even that much of um, sorry, it's not even that much of like uh, that too long ago. It's like 
texts from the 19th century or the 20th century. So basically there was a lot of incidents in that led to that. And so it really took a lot of effort to re for my ancestors to retain what they actually had. It took a lot of efforts for my grandparents, my parents, to retain Hinduism, especially when there were so much new factors that kind of went against it. So you have to be really grateful for that. And one of the biggest things we lost, as I mentioned before, was language. And that is something that I find really difficult to deal with in this Hindu community. As I mentioned before, I'm a singer. And I recall that one event that I went to actually in early September, it was a Hindu youth conference or summit. And I went to there and I explained the story like, you know, I come from endangered servants in Guyana and they lost their language and they lost a lot of things. We don't know how to do customs and traditions like the majority does. We know how to do it, but there is slight variation because remember True. I said there's a lot of, there is a lot of like loss in like loss in the generations and also different parts celebrated differently or do different things and so when you come from very many different parts and you go into one area there there is a lot of um loss of those co customs as well so essentially what happens is that i explained this and as well as someone else who was indo-caribbean and i remember we had this talent show segment and i was a singer there and they told me afterwards a per an individual told me oh you sing weird like your accent's weird, your words are not like perfectly clear. And I'm like, but it's not my native language. I don't know how to speak Hindi. It's very frustrating to have that natural assumption that Absolutely. I know how to speak Hindi. You didn't, you didn't grow up with it. No, I didn't grow up with it at all. My parents don't know it. Neither is my grandparents really well. They don't know it. So you don't grow up with it. You're trying to adapt and learn it. You take longer to learn these bhajans and kirtans than probably the average person from the majority. And um, it's not even just there. You come back home, you hear, you have it in this youth environment that we're in as well. Like, oh, you sing, but you're not like authentic. It's like you're not authentic enough. And this creates a sort of inferiority but you have to remember that you you have to remember your background and that you're doing as well as you can and that you're doing it for dharma you're not doing it for anybody That's else true. intent is more important than the actual delivery you yeah. know um girls I, I want to share with you like you know aditi has been like you know doing advocacy on the kashmir issue um i'm i was born in kashmir i'm i'm a, I'm a hindu from kashmir who were basically kicked out some 35 years back and today is that what we call the holocaust uh, day or the holocaust night for us 19 january 1990 when half a million people were forced to leave the valley of kashmir and it has been 35 years i haven't gone back to my home so we are talking about a few hundred years about caribbean people like the indians who went to caribbeans i have been out of my kashmir for just 35 years our kids don't speak uh, the, the mother tongue we have started, you know, not following the rituals. So what happens in 35 years is nothing compared to what you have been following. But you still have been able to, like, you know, withhold onto it. And that's really commendable. So have there been any instances when your unique identity made you feel marginalized? I think you just uh, narrated it. Yeah, I just briefly touched upon it. It's specifically when I usually sing. Um, that's one of them because it feels like I'm inferior. I always do. And I, it's like when I go to sing at these events, I feel like I don't feel like excited or happy. It always feels like I'm going to get criticized at the end of them. And it's not just from like, it's not just within like a university. It's beyond it as well. As I mentioned, I went to summit or the way we do traditions. I feel like I always have to adapt to everyone else's and I'm like but you know we do it different too we have our traditions as well so it's like you get labeled kind of like an outsider and they don't kind of understand how you work and that's you know I should probably like speak up about it too we should you know understand each other more because us as Hindus in general we're a bit fragmented and I think it's important for all of us to kind of come together and be one big team because we have Hindus from across the world and we all do things very differently even in different states of india so it's very hard to to like uh, 
to always have to be the one to like adapt or to learn all the time. And there's that you have to adapt. And there's also that they give you the expectation of not just language that you know all these things that the, the occur in Hinduism. Yeah. So. And I'm like, but I, I don't know. Like it was my first time celebrating like Ratha Yatra and Makar Sankranti through HSC. I'm like, this is something that we are starting to learn as Indo-Caribbeans, but it hasn't been like a tradition of ours. So I Whatever. guess it's based Basically you know, adjusting. intent is intent is more important, and you should not basically give up just because some people talk about it. You should keep on basically, you know, raising that that flag or keeping the flame alight. <clears throat> I'm coming out to Kushi. Kushi, in your journey as a Hindu artist, how have you navigated misrepresentation of Hindu culture in the Western narrative? Um, I think uh, it's very well. I don't. I don't think you like visibly see it in other, um, in like art per se. Um, but when you enter spaces as an artist, like art galleries, right? Or academia specifically, you can see like, you know, you you will be cornered because your art is from Hinduism and Hinduism to like Hindu phobia in the art space, because a lot of people are very, like, you know, like Aditi said, like they're very progressive and they're very um, left-minded or liberal. Um, they have this it's it's clear misinformation that they see hinduism hindu pride equals hindu nationalism or you know or you know like that i personally as an artist have extremist beliefs um an example of this was in a class actually um in my third year i was making um i wanted to make my project for the semester about yoga and how yoga has become this tool of oppression in the west that you know like it it is something that comes from hinduism but then hindus are placed outside of it um you know you we have a running joke in toronto that if you don't le- if you don't learn yoga from a white person are you actually doing yoga so it's you know like the 200 uh, 200 hour 300 hour teaching courses and then these people are become like kundalini and chakra and atma cleaning experts and that's just not how it works so i wanted to talk about bhagavad gita and how like and how bhagavad gita talks about yoga and you know how there's different types of yoga and present like a decolonized version of yoga and my professor like clearly she said uh, the first thing she asked me so how do you reconcile for the oppression of minorities in india with your project and i'm like you know it doesn't make sense Biased. it's it's yeah it was clear that she had a particular view and she started talking about like modi and and i'm like hey like you know i'm i'm a north american artist i am in a north american education space and i'm talking about yoga in the context of north america so why is like this pressure on me to constantly have to prove myself that yes i'm hindu but yes i don't have like ex- i'm not an extremist right like you know this this constant need to like prove yourself and prove that your hindu identity is equally as valid as any other identity um and and that's not only me i've seen that with other artists at okad as well is um that the hindu art is not very well received like you apply with a hindu piece in a gallery your the chances of you getting in are very low as long as like you know you need to like cater to them and cater to their language and the words that they're looking for um to be entered or to be accepted into like a famous art collective or an art gallery right Mm -hmm. i mean the narrative will be always against us but we have to navigate through it exactly so uh aditi i'm coming back to you how do you respond to false labels and acquisitions like being anti-muslim while advocating for Hindu rights? Right, so um, growing up, I've always been super vocal for minority rights, but ever since I started talking about Hindu phobia and Hindu genocide, I've been subjected to an immense amount of um, anti-Hindu bias, anti-Hindu sentiment, specifically dog whistles by my peers, like accusations of being anti-Muslim. And I've never, I've truly never felt so discriminated against. It's hard enough being a person of color in this country, but being discriminated against as a Hindu is far harder. And there was a particular incident a few months ago where I was accused by my peers of having a political and discriminatory agenda in my advocacy work, which we need to recognize 
Both of these are classic anti-Hindu dog whistles. And I wasn't just accused, but I was ridiculed, yelled at, and continuously spoken over. And the whole experience made me feel incredibly lonely and unsafe as a Hindu student on campus. And I was also like told to stop. I was actually like harassed to, yeah. I was tried to force me to stop posting about Hindu genocide because it's a very political, because it's a very political topic. And um, there was an incident, um, there was a particular incident a couple of months ago where I received a death threat wow. and I receive death threats on a daily basis at this point and it's gotten out of hand, but the pol politicizing the Hindu identity and Hindu advocacy are classic dog whistles. And it's crucial to emphasize that Hindu advocacy is completely devoid of any political agenda. It simply aims to raise awareness about Hindu phobia and Hindu genocide and the struggles of the Hindu community. And these, isu and these issues transcend modern political landscapes and they have deep historical roots. And furthermore, I'm a Canadian citizen, so I can't vote in Indian elections. So when they claim that I have a political, specifically a nationalistic agenda, like we've all heard of the Hindu nationalist, you know, dog whistle, that um, they're just basic, they're baseless accusations are completely false. And they serve to silence me and silence others who choose to speak up about Hindu phobia and impede our efforts to raise awareness. And this pattern is becoming more and more evident as I encounter similar incidents. It's tough. And I'm so sorry to know that, like, you know, uh you have been facing you know death threats and that that's that's scary we are in a part of world which is considered to be peaceful and and you know very inclusive but again it's not easy to basically you know do advocacy and fight the odds because if you see the renaissance among hinduism has come up in the last decade only we have been on the receiving end for all these years and now hindu is suddenly like you know awakening and and knowing their rights and knowing who, who we are and what we are you know we are not apologetic anymore the, like way we have been all these centuries and you know millennia i'm coming back to kashmina kashmina we talked about dog whistles how so how how has facing bias and dog whistles impacted your advocacy and personal camp experiences on the campus in terms of like dog whistles i guess it's more like when you want to bring up incidents that happens within the hindu community and the biases is more of like being of caribbean descent than actually being hindu like being as i mentioned before being caribbean descent i guess there's like there's obviously people um connect more with the majority but being part of a minority is a very hard thing because like you just don't fit in with the group you're just not um appreci i i feel like i'm not appreciated much because i'm not part of the bigger picture i'm more of like more of the smaller pictures or the smaller details on this big vast idea of hinduism and in terms of um so when you kind of talk about it you're you're trying to like tell them oh i'm of a different you know background and we do things differently here we don't speak the language it's like they are like okay i get it but basically internalizing it and actually accepting it on the inside is a different story than just knowing something about it and that's where i feel like the biases come in because biases really show when you, there's actually events when there's actually meetings and when there's actually hindu gatherings because then you get to see like they know that this that i'm not the same yet it still doesn't play out that way or it only plays out when it's convenient or when it's to prove a point and i'm like well no you don't get to pretend that i'm caribbean half the time and then you don't accept it or you don't acknowledge it the other half of the time so that kind of thing and also in terms of dog whistling i think sometimes it also comes from your own hindu peers which i think um, aditi can come on to when you're trying to promote or you're trying to advocate especially as, um, a platform of hindu students i feel like sometimes we have to highlight these issues that occur because we have to put up 
part of our, dar our dharma is that we're not supposed to always take the hit all the time. Eventually, our books say you have to get up and you have to say something. You have to fight back because it's a dharma to take it all the time. Yeah. And people would say like, but it's too political. And I'm like, there's a difference between history and there's a difference between being political. Right. So um, I believe, Kushi, you had been on Bara Darshan. Am I right? Uh, unmute yourself, Kushi. So yeah. can you please describe in detail how challenging the Bar Darshan was? What were the, some challenges you faced at the organizational, institutional, and personal level? Of course. Um, so Bar Darshan, we were just a new organization on campus at the time. Um, two people, me and the vice president at the time, were the only two people on board. Um, and it was, we had a small, very close-knit committee who was, are like organizing the first ever Hindu exhibition in Toronto. So understanding the challenges of Hindu artists and how like there's a lack of representation and there's a lack of acceptance of Hindus in the art scene, we were like, okay, you know what, let's collaborate with other organizations and um, have a Hindu only art exhibit, right? So it featured 35 plus Hindu artists and they were performers, and visual artists and it was a three-day show it turned out to be a grand show but then at the same time like um like it happened with Rathayatra we had been very clear about what Bharat Darshan was and it was non-political in nature and the call for artists also said that we are only focusing on non-political art at the moment um two days before the show our school organized, and the the story actually ties into this as well. That the Bharat Darshan was in March. In February, we get a email from another student group on campus asking to come and watch a film. The film showed um, it was an art film that was made by an Indian film director, and um, it, it talked about caste oppression in India and how caste oppression has worsened under for the past five, 10 years because of Hindu nationalism, because of the rising Hindu nationalism in India. Um, they wanted the Hindu Students Council to come into that space and asked us to, oh, we would love for you to come and then explain yourselves after the film. And that, like, which we denied, we're like, you know, but we tried to petition that to the school. I'm like, hey, like, you know, Hindu students are constantly going through these things but the schools depart like the DEI departments at the time said that it's freedom of speech and expression um two days after the film and one thing that the film highlighted was students are agents of radical change um the the next morning of the film all the posters of Bharat Darshan were vandalized throughout the university oh, and it peak. said um no Hindu nationalism in Canada India doesn't need this we were disheartened and I think we were in the infancy of HSC. Um, it, it was just such a scary moment for us. We had installed the show. There's like thousands of dollars of artworks within that space. And we were scared that, you know, like people are going to like vandalize. Um, talk to the university. They arranged for security. And um, I think that Bharat Darshan actually added was a catalyst to like this whole anti-Hindu hatred on campus. And the school actually started listening to us about these issues, um, you know, and recognizing that Hindu hate is, as a matter of fact, real. They found, we had to go to the police um, to ensure the safety of the students. Cause I personally live in Brampton, but there are students that live very close to the campus. And their safety is in danger because I started HSC and, you know, my co-president and I were fine. But then we were like, hey, like, you know, there are students that could be followed home because our names are on the website and our mm. names are directly attached to the, you know, the social media and students could be docked or doxxed or attacked. Um, and he, uh, so we had to, like, inform the police about this. And when the investigation happened, actually, um, it turned out the student was inspired by the film that they shown. Um, and she did this as a form of political expression that she learned 
after watching the film and in a class that taught art and social change. It, I think what was, uh, you know, heartbreaking was that, and it's always with Hindu hatred on campus, anything else against any other community will not be tolerated. But this was vandalism. Vandalism is a crime in Canada. Seeing that and the university initially treating it as freedom of expression and, you know, like they were just expressing themselves. But I think the the dean did a really good job and the administration did a really good job of listening to us and like working with us for these issues. And uh, but, you know, like and this wasn't the last time that this was something like this was happening. We've had so many instances on campus where. Hindu students just for making Hindu art. I have a Kashmiri friend and uh, she graduated, the co-president at the time, she's from Kashmir. And she was making, um, so she's a textile design student and she was making, you know, like her embroidery was inspired by her grandparents' embroidery at the time when mm. they had to leave Kashmir. Um, students came and they said, oh, like, but you guys are just like vandalizing from like Pakistan or something, you know, like name calling. Yeah, name calling. And um, she got wished multiple times, um, you know, like multiple times on uh, 14th November or something. Oh, happy Kashmir Day. And the first time she's like, hey, like, you know, I'm Indian. Like, I don't celebrate that. That's a very dark day for me. Next year, again, that thing happens. Coming to an institution and your peers wishing you that again and again knowing that you know like that is a very traumatic thing for you it is scary when you post about this being a kashmiri who has seen like you know you carry forward that intergenerational trauma the trauma yeah and you, as uh, my family moved from pakistan when the partition happened and i hear um, my grandfather's story because my great grandfather didn't make it in partition so he moved here with like three or four younger siblings Sister. and, you know, raising them. I feel that intergenerational yeah. trauma passed down. At, and then this is very recent. This is 30 years ago. This is 30 years ago. And, you know, seeing that your identity doesn't, is constantly threatened on campuses, I think that is very hard. And... True. And I think, like, if she was making a project that was... Clearly, um, talking about Hindu, like Kish the Kashmiri Hindu genocide, like very explicitly, she would have faced even more um, backlash. You know, backlash from professors and students. And um, the first time I posted about uh, the Kashmiri genocide on my social media, I lost so many followers or so many people that I thought were my friends, which is, you know, like, it's good when you talk about oppression, but it's only one-sided. And Hindu phobia is just that conversation. It's a one-sided conversation. You know, when you're talking about decolonizing, uh, I was just talking about this with another group this morning that construction of the Ram Mandir itself should be a win for the global left because this is what they stand for. They stand for indigenous rights. They stand for oppression. They stand for the entire land back movement, which is give the indigenous people their land back. However, the their agendas are pretty clear. They're selective in their them, approaches. They're selective in their approaches. Mm -hmm. And whatever politically suits them, they go with that tide. Exactly. Exactly. And you know, like, and that's where like this Hindu hatred comes. And people are constantly denying Hindu phobia. Like, you know, Hindu phobia is not real. Hindu phobia is not real. Yeah, tell that to students who, in my university, uh, one of um, our HSC execs now, he wasn't a lot, he wasn't very religious in his first two years. Um, he had a group where it was a Muslim-dominated group. On many occasions, they tried feeding him beef. They tried, they're like, oh yeah, Sam, like, you know, say, say this prayer after me. And they tried, they're like, oh my God. And then, you know, when these tactics don't work, they're like, oh, um, you know, like, bro, like, just convert. Like, it'll be so good that if you just convert. And we see, like, these instances happening as early as 
elementary school in Ontario. So it's, it's, it's very, it's very scary. It's very scary, and it's it it's against the 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 concept of like you know plurality in in Canada, where we call ourselves a melting pot, exactly. where every religion should basically be free of you know any external aggression. Exactly. Exactly. My next question is to Aditi. Uh, Aditi, why you, do you feel it's our responsibility as students in Canada to advocate for Hindus in other countries? You have been doing a lot of advocacy uh, for Hindus in Pakistan, who are reduced in numbers in the last seventy-five years. Yeah, I mean, Hindus in Pakistan. I think pre-partition, the population was twenty-one point two percent. It was around that number, and now it's like less than 2.1%. And that's because of like mass persecution and forced conversions. And the thing is, if we don't speak up, who will? No one else is speaking up. I mean, people within the Hindu youth community aren't speaking up as well. And we need to address, you know, the inferiority complexes within the Hindu youth community. And it hits close to home because I've personally encountered significant problems with fellow Hindus. I've been ostracized by them when I bravely speak out against Hindu phobia and Hindu genocide. And the impact of this issue is becoming more apparent when I experience the loss of friendships within the Hindu community solely because I choose to speak up. And people I considered my friends suddenly distance themselves from me. They expressed discomfort with my engagement in this conversation about Hindu genocide. And the reality was revealed through subsequent conversations. Their hesitation stemmed from the fact that majority of their social circle consisted of non-Hindus, specifically, you know, Muslims and people who identify as South Asian. And it became evident it became evident that these Hindus, like these fellow Hindus that are succumbing succumbing to external pressures and intimidations are from their non-Hindu friends. And they're by they're therefore confirming to the very dog vessels that perpetuate Hindu phobia and try to silence me. And we need to work on having more discourse within the Hindu youth community, talking more about Hindu genocide. And I focus a lot on the Kashmir Hindu genocide because it's a great focal point given the fact that it only happened 34 years ago. Like today is the 34th anniversary of the seventh genocide of Kashmir Hindus. True. When people think of Hindu genocide, they think of something that happened during ancient Indian times, right? But no, it started, it started around the seventh century and it persists today. And there were several occasions in 2023, okay, just last year, where several Pakistani Hindu women were converted or they were trafficked and forcefully kidnapped. And on February 26, 2023, just less than a year ago, a Kashmiri Hindu man, Sanjay Sharma, was murdered because his crime was existing as a Hindu in Kashmir. And that's why I focus more on like recent things. Like we can talk about, you know, the Mughal Empire and their impact on the Hindu community. They persecuted us by the millions, but it's still happening today. Right? See, we hear about the the, the, uh, the irony. The irony is that we talked about so many genocides. We talk about the Rwandan genocide. We talk about the Jewish genocide, but nobody talks about the Hindu genocide, which is the biggest in the quantum. And you know, like if we talk about, you said you mentioned seventh exodus of Kashmiri Hindus. Okay. So genocides have happened once in other communities, but the only continuous genocide has happened in Kashmir. The modus operandi has always been the same. Like when Kashmiris were given only three cho choices, relive, salive, or galive, which means either you convert or you flee or will kill you. And the same modus operandi started like 600 years back and it still continues. Hmm. So it's a, it's a huge issue, but the only way is basically to follow the Sanatan way of telling people about it. We don't have to basically get into arguments. We don't have to basically get aggressive about it. But we have to tell people about it until as we speak, like the way you have been basically speaking to the right people at the right places and making things happen. I can go on and on on this very sensitive topic. But time is a constraint. Maybe we can meet again one day. And I thank you girls for, for being so passionate about what you're doing. I bow to the Nari Shakti in you. And I wish, like, you know, more girls come up and more boys come up. I don't know why boys are missing from this advocacy. Thank you so much for being part of this uh, program, the tagline with Vidya Bhushandar. And I hope to see you again one day. Jai Shri Ram. And I wish you all the best for your work. And see you again. Namaskar. Thank you. Thank you. Namaste. Jai Shri Ram. Jai Shri Ram. Jai Shri Ram.